Hi! In this video, we're going to look at some line integrals that are called work or circulation or flow integrals. So I have over here a vector field and I'm just going to talk about the idea and then we'll get into the details of what this integral is. So the idea is that I have some sort of vector field that might represent a force or some kind of fluid flow field or airflow field. And then I also have some sort of object that maybe moves through that vector field. So you could think about current in a river and maybe a fish swimming through the current. And so we've got a path of an object that moves through that vector field given by this curve C. So it would be important to understand that the vectors in the vector field could not be the only force acting on an object if it moves in that way through this vector field that I drew. Uh, if the object didn't have any other forces on it, then it would follow the vectors in the vector field. Um, so maybe thinking about a fish where it has its own power that it can swim, but also there is current pushing on it, and so we might be able to consider the force of the vector field that would be the current of the water that it's swimming through. Basically, the idea here is that we want to calculate the work done by that vector field F as an object is moved along C. Okay, so going back to some prior things that you learned about work, if you have a constant force and that force just acts exactly in the direction of the displacement of the object, one of the first things that you learned might have been that work is force times displacement. Um, so that would assume that the force is constant and that it is acting along a linear displacement and in exactly the same direction as the displacement. One of the applications that we looked at earlier in the semester to do with vectors was that work is a vector force dot a displacement r. So that would be helpful if you have some sort of force and the object is maybe not moving in the same direction as the force. Perhaps the displacement of the object is in some other direction than the force is acting. So you might think about pulling along the handle of a wagon and the wagon pulls along the ground, but the force you're exerting on that is through the handle. It's not exactly in the same direction as the wagon moves along the ground. So we basically just want to extend that idea here. The complicating factor here is that I've got a variable force. So my force vectors are different direction and different magnitude at different places along here. And the other thing is that I don't have a displacement along a vector. I have my path moving along this curve. But the idea is that we're going to use the ideas of an integral. We're going to partition our curve up into pieces. We're going to use some vectors to represent those little pieces of the curve. Those would be little r vectors, basically. And then we can look at the f dot r at different points along that curve and we can define a line integral that will give us that work. So then the question is how do we handle those details? Uh, so we're going to partition the curve in each of those c's. We're going to choose a point and if my curve is parameterized by a vector valued function then that point xy is going to be associated with a t value. And so what I'm going to do in order to get a vector that approximates the curve is I'm going to use a vector that would naturally be along that curve at that point. This does assume you have a smooth parameterization of your curve, but provided we have a smooth parameterization, then we can use unit tangent vectors all along the curve that would be tangent to the curve as approximations. The issue is though that those unit tangent vectors are one unit long and we really want a vector that is as long as our little partition here. So we're going to calculate that unit tangent vector at each of those points and then what I want to do is rescale that unit tangent vector so that it is the, approximately the same length as the curve. So remembering that that unit tangent vector is a unit vector, if I multiply that by the arc length of the curve. What this gives us is a vector that's along the curve but would be the same length as the little pieces of the curve. Okay, so we're going to dot product that with our f and that will give us the work done by the vector f at whatever point we have on the curve there. As the object moves along that little piece of the curve, we're going to add them all up all along the curve and we're going to take the limit as the norm of the partition 
approaches zero. And provided that limit exists and is the same for all such partitions and choices of points, then we get our integral that would be our work integral. So this would be an f dot t ds integral. And that gives us work done by f as an object is moved along this curve. That does require a smooth parameterization. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this means. We're going to look at some graphs and then we'll talk about evaluating them. Okay, so here I have a vector field drawn and a few different curves drawn on top of the vector field. And what we want to think about here is being able to look at these curves and look at this vector field and think about whether that work integral would be positive, negative, or zero. For this first curve, C1, if you visualize those unit tangent vectors, I do have a scale here of one unit, so I can see how long one unit would be. So unit tangent vectors would be one unit long tangent to the curve. So when I think about the C1 curve, and I look at that work integral along C1, what I really want to think about is this f dot t positive, negative, or zero, or some of each as we move along that curve. And so that goes back to what we did a long time ago when we looked at dot products of vectors and thinking about dot products being positive, negative, or zero based on the geometry of the vectors. So I'm looking at the unit tangent vector that I drew to the curve and the f vectors that are in the vector field. Those are the blue vectors that were printed here on the screen before I drew any vectors. And so what I'm looking at is the angle between those vectors. And because the f and t vectors all along that curve form an obtuse angle, the f dot t all along that curve will be negative, all along c1. So when I add them all up, add up all the f dot t values all along that curve for c1, this work will be negative. All right, if I look at c2, draw this unit tangent vector in red here. If I look at that unit tangent vector that I drew there for C2, and I think about the line integral of f dot t ds along that second curve, uh, you should be able to notice that the t vector that I drew and the f vectors that were already printed there, those are nearly lined up with each other. So the f dot t's will all be positive along that curve. And even down here, they do form an acute angle here. All along that curve, my f dot t's will be positive. So this work integral is positive. And you might think about that as the vectors in the vector field are sort of helping push the object as it moves along that curve. Whereas in the first one, the vectors in the vector field are pushing against the motion of the object as it moves along the curve. So thinking about positive or negative work. In this last one here, if I draw an approximation of my unit tangent vector there, uh, you'll see that in some places along there, it looks like the f vector and the t vector maybe form almost a right angle. In some places, maybe an acute angle, and in some places, maybe an obtuse angle, but they're pretty close to each other and they pretty much balance out. When the f and t are orthogonal, your f dot t would be zero. Here, I would have a positive f dot t because of the acute angle. But on the back end of the curve, I would have a negative f dot t because I have an obtuse angle. And when I think about adding that all up along that whole curve there for c3, then I'm probably going to get a sum that is approximately 0 along there. So I have some help from the vectors in the vector field and some push against the motion from the vectors in the vector field, but the net force on the object as it moves along there would be zero in the direction of motion. So this integral, when we first started talking about that, we called this a work integral. It's called a work integral if the f is a force. If the f in your vector field represents some sort of fluid flow or air flow, then the integral, the same integral, f dot t ds integrated along the curve is called flow along the curve, or sometimes it's called circulation. Usually when it's called circulation, that means the curve is closed. And so a closed curve would be if I have a complete loop, or it could be a square or a triangle or something like that, but where it comes back to its starting point. So I sometimes call this integral a work slash flow slash circ integral. And so you should recognize that it's really all the same integral. It just has different names based on different contexts. These are some alternate forms of the integral. 
There are several different forms here that are sometimes easier to work with. Your textbook has most of these in there. Remembering that if my curve has an arc length parameterization given by R of S, then T is defined to be dr ds. So in the first step from my integral of f dot t ds, all I did was replace the T with its definition. In the next step there, I just simplified the differential. So similar to the way that you simplify things with use substitutions and think about differentials there. This is a form I use a lot, f dot dr. In the step after that, I basically wrote what dr would mean if you have an R of T smooth parameterization. So a lot of students also like to use that. If you write out the components for the f vector and the dr dt vector, that's what you have in the next step there. And then the step after that, I've just actually done the dot product where I took the first component of one vector times the first component of the second vector and so on. The last step, this is a form a lot of times students don't recognize as a work integral, but it is handy to recognize this as a work integral. This integral comes up in a lot of application problems that we'll do, and if you recognize it as a work integral, sometimes it simplifies your calculations on it, and there are some theorems that are sometimes helpful to use as you evaluate that. All right, let's go ahead and look at a quick, easy example. There's some more videos with some more complicated examples next. Okay, so we're gonna find the work done by this vector field as an object is moved along this curve shown in the graph below. So if I had a picture of the vector field, I could maybe think about whether I expect my work to be positive or negative or approximately zero. I don't have a picture of the vector field, I do have a picture of the curve. All right, so if we're doing work, then the integral I'm calculating is this integral of f dot t ds but I often rewrite that in that form I said I like to use a lot as f dot dr. And so let's go through and talk about that. My f vector is here, although I know if I'm going to do a line integral, I need to convert all of that to be in terms of t. r would come from a parameterization of my curve. So sometimes you're given parameterizations of your curves and sometimes you have to come up with them. This one is a circle of radius two counterclockwise with center at the origin. So you should remember, hopefully from what we did at the beginning of this semester, a simple parameterization of that where t goes from zero to two pi and that has the correct orientation. So that would be my parameterization. So once I've got that set up, it's really just a matter of doing the dot product, getting everything in terms of t, and then doing the integration. And when you looked at some line integrals before, remember that the x and y in your vector field are going to come from your x equation and your y equations for the parameterization of your curve. So when I set up this integral, my t values will go 0 to 2 pi, my f will be x, y squared, but in place of the x and in place of the y, I'm going to put my equations of my curve. And now I need to take that dot dr. So I'm going to do dot, and then my dr, similar to how when you do a u substitution, if you have u equals some function of x, your du is du dx times dx. So your dr is going to be dr dt, so this is the derivative of my r function dt. Okay, at that point I have it all set up. I need to go ahead and do the dot product. There's some simplifying that will happen when I do that and then do the integration. This is a place a lot of students make some careless mistakes and then their integration turns into a nightmare. Um, in general, your integration shouldn't be that bad, although you probably will end up integrating a lot of powers of sines and cosines in this chapter. So you may need to go back and review a little bit of that if you don't remember it. Okay, so here I've gone ahead and done the dot product, and now I need to go ahead and do the integration. This first one is a u substitution, u equals sine t. This second term here, I would do a different u substitution. I would let u equal cosine t. And then on the last one, I would use that double angle identity for cosine squared. Okay, so I've gone ahead and done the integrations. I didn't simplify the coefficients yet. I then need to go ahead and plug in my limits of integration and evaluate. So when I do that, you want to be careful to make sure that you don't cross things out that aren't really zero. And so we end up with four pi here at the end. Okay, so positive work, which means that the net 
flow of the vector field along that curve is with the curve. I might have some with and some against the curve, but I have more with than against the curve. Or I would have acute angles more often than obtuse angles. The other thing that sometimes students think about, and this is something that comes from physics, sometimes students in physics have learned that work along a closed loop is zero. And so I intentionally chose this to be a closed path. Work around a closed path is zero in very specific kinds of vector fields. Gravitational fields and electromagnetic fields have those properties. And so you might have learned some things in physics that were very specific to the kinds of vector fields you were working in. But not all vector fields work like that. Fluid flow fields, for example, current flowing through a river, airflow fields are not, they don't have those properties that necessarily work along a closed loop will be zero. So it's important that you are clear about things that you might already know about things like work and whether they apply in all situations or maybe just in those particular situations that you've worked with before. All right, try some homework.